Well, happy Sunday, Trinity Online. Welcome here. We are so glad that you are tuning in with us today. As you can probably see behind me, the room is buzzing. Everyone is here. They are chatting. There is a, a joy just in this room. And we hope that wherever you're joining us from, uh, that you're feeling just a sense of joy and a sense of excitement for what God has uh, for you today. And you know what? I just want to share something that's just been shared across our team this morning. Um, God sees you. No matter where you are, we know that God has a plan for you and he wants to uh, say something to you. And, you know, the fact that Jesus was man and he can relate to what it was like to have a good week, he knows what it was like to have a bad week. Um, but either way, he came back to the Father and the Father always said, hey, I see you. We're going to be stepping into uh, another week of the Jesus way and we're going to talk about the woman who just really wanted to be seen by God. Um, we're going to hear more about that from Scott. It's going to be a powerful morning. We are expecting big things today and we know that God has has something specific to say to you today. Thanks for joining us. Let's do it together. Trinity Church family, my name is Bex and I'm here to tell you about the top three things going on here at Trinity in the coming weeks. We truly believe that we are better together and every opportunity that we have to get connected is a good one. Let's check it out. First up is an invitation for you to step into some incredible volunteer opportunities this Easter. Before we know it, Good Friday and Easter will be here and we're so excited for the chance to celebrate and reflect on the death and resurrection of Jesus in this community. There's more information to come on those specific gatherings in the coming weeks, but what we can say today is that we already know that your help will be needed more than ever to make those services happen. Specifically, we are asking for willing volunteers to jump onto our Trinity Kids team on Easter Sunday. We have been overjoyed with the amount of kids that have come through our doors on weekends lately. We are hitting record highs. And the reality is that number will be high for Easter as well. To ensure the best experience possible for our kids and to maintain our safety standards, we will need more team members in those spaces. In addition, we are also looking for more awesome people to help supersize our parking team this Easter Sunday. If greeting people with a smile and organization are gifts of yours, we need you. As we strive to become the best hosts possible for our community, we hope that you will consider how God may be prompting you to serve. It'll be an all hands on deck weekend and we can't wait to see what's gonna happen as we celebrate the life of Jesus. To sign up today, fill out a Trinity Kids team member or welcome team member application on the volunteer page of our website today. At number two, we've launched another round of Community Group Connect here at Trinity. And if you're still searching for a group and some people to connect with, this is just for you. Join us over a free meal to explore what a group might look like and to make a first time connection that may encourage you and your faith in a way that you never expected. Whether you're new to faith or you have known Jesus for your whole life, we know that everyone needs community and you're invited to invest in ours right here at Trinity. To be a church that is unified and seeking Jesus, we gotta stay connected. And at number three, we've got our Trinity Men's Drop-In next Sunday evening here at Trinity. On the last Sunday of each month, all men are invited to come and hang out in the refinery. There you can expect to meet someone new, having a meaningful conversation that encourages you and your faith, jump into a game of basketball or pool or ping pong and more. Whether you're 18 or 81, a father and a son combo or on your own, we believe that simple gatherings like this are always great opportunities for God to transform our stories. To find out how to engage with these three things this week or any week, visit trinitychurchcolona.ca, check us out on social media or talk to someone at the link after the service for more information. We've got a great service ahead of us today. And we truly believe that when you press into the moments that we get to share in these next 75 minutes, you will encounter the living God. Don't hold anything back. Let's set our sights on Jesus together. Well, good morning, church family. It's great to be together. Let's stand. 
in hope and in faith, we bring our hallelujah. We bring praise to a God who we believe is in control and reigning above it all. Let's sing this out together. Come on. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. Hallelujah, heaven comes to fight for me. Sing it out. I raise a hallelujah with everything inside of me. I raise a hallelujah. I will watch the darkness flee. Yes, we will. I raise a hallelujah.
there's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Let's sing. And hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. Consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. This is the God that we worship. Praise your name, the name above all names. The name above every other name. And the angels cry, holy, all creation cry. Holy, you are lifted. 
is my firm foundation the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaken I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus he's never let me down he's faithful through change So why would he fail now? He won't. No, he won't. And I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going under. I'm not.
pray with me. God, we want you to be our firm foundation. We want you to be the rock on which we stand. We want to trust that you will show up on the mountaintop and that you will find us in our valleys. God, we want to be people who lean in and listen to your still, small voice. And we want to be a community of people who eagerly say yes when you invite us to do something here in this church, in this city, and in our world. God, this morning as we sing, as we connect, as we gather, would you be worshipped? Would you be praised? Would you be adored? Because God, you are so incredibly worthy. God, would you go before us this morning? Amen. You guys can go ahead and grab a seat. Well, whether you are in the room with us here or joining us online, we are so glad that you have made this time together a part of your weekly rhythm. My name is Caitlin, and I am actually just like you you. I've been a part of our church community here at Trinity for the last four years with my husband, and uh, we call Trinity home. And I have a heart to serve wherever and whenever there is an area of need. I've been serving for the last number of years with the creative arts team, uh, doing things like three things and in the know and some content during COVID. And most recently, I have been serving with our young adults community. Um, I have served as a community group leader. I've served as a table leader for Alpha, and I hang out every Sunday morning in the West Lobby for Coffee Connect. So for those of you who do not know what Coffee Connect is, we gather as a young adult community every Sunday morning between 9.30 and 10 a.m. in the West Lobby. It's an opportunity for us to grab a coffee, to connect, to catch up on our week, to meet new people, and then we actually all come in and we sit together for the service. So if you are a young adult between the ages of 18 to 20 something, and you are looking to get connected and to plug in and to find people that you can do life with, we would love to invite you to join us next Sunday and every Sunday after that in the West Lobby. Now, speaking of doing life together, there were a number of you that joined us just this past weekend for our AGM. And if you were here, you know that we talked a lot about numbers. <laughs> numbers were on the screen, numbers were in the conversation. And as I was sitting and listening, I was struck with this realization. Um, the numbers are incredibly important, and we all know that. But they were important for me uh, in a really new way. And as I was sitting and looking and listening at these numbers, um, I realized that every single number that I was hearing and seeing represented someone in our faith community who was giving generously. That every number was a story about someone who had saved, sacrificed, been intentional, and was practicing generosity. And so if you are a part of that community who is giving regularly here at Trinity and partnering with what God is doing here, we are so incredibly grateful. And if you would like to start giving uh, and contributing to what God is doing here, you can check out the ways to give on the screen. You can always give through cash, check, online, or tap. We want to be a community of people who are practicing generosity so regularly that we become generous people in every space that we find ourselves and that it flows out of us so naturally. Well, this weekend also officially kicks off the beginning of spring break. So exciting. We can clap for that. Um, but it also marks the official three-week countdown for our Easter weekend. So if you've been around here before, you know that we love celebrating at Easter. And there's more information that's going to come your way on the details surrounding Good Friday and Easter Sunday services. But what we want you to know today is that during our Easter weekend, we are going to be celebrating baptism. 
And we love celebrating baptism around here because we love celebrating life change, the change that happens in us and the change that happens in our community when someone says yes to following Jesus, when someone decides to make a physical declaration that represents an inward spiritual transformation in their life. And so if you're sitting here today or you're watching online and you're wondering if baptism is the next step for you in your faith journey, I have two questions for you. And the first is this, do you believe that Jesus died for the forgiveness of your sins? And the second is, do you desire to follow him for the rest of your life? If you can answer a resounding yes to those questions, then baptism may be the next step for you. And if you hear those questions and they fill you with a lot of doubt, that's okay. I wanna introduce you to a friend of ours named Donnie. About a year ago, around this time, Donnie was asked those same two questions. Here is part of his story. I had a pretty long and painful drift away from God and the church, but once I'd recommitted my heart to Christ, I really wanted a fresh start. I wanted to go public, to get baptized. I had doubts, big doubts, like, was I ready? Did I have enough faith? Did I have my stuff together? You can still have questions, even big questions. But if you believe, if you've made the decision to follow Jesus, then you're ready. Now, a year after being baptized, I'm beginning to experience the love of God through the Spirit. I can tangibly feel it resonate and get through the cracks of my heart and past my defenses. It's reignited a desire to serve, to, to dissolve the ego, to, to put others ahead of myself, to wanna to forgive, and not to hold on and protect to what I have, but wanting to give. I'm still not there, because there really is no there, but I keep moving because that last step, it made me better, more fulfilled, happier, and safer. This journey of faith isn't just an emotion or a feeling, it's an ongoing act of obedience. So take that next step. Oh yeah, you can clap for that too, come on now. That was so much fun baptizing Donnie. Uh, that's old school vibes in the refinery there, people in the horse trough. And that was, uh, uh, that was <laughs> I don't know if we want to forget that or remember those days. Uh, for Donnie, it was so poignant. It was so poignant for me because I've known Donnie for years and, and watched his story and then watched him again to discover God afresh, new. You know, in the midst of all his circumstances and all the potential failures or dashed hopes or experiences where he asked God some pretty significant questions. And then his gentle step of faith and trust forward. And then uh, to be able to baptize him. And we had such a great moment. And embracing him was, uh, was so moving for me. And seeing what God continues to do in Donnie's life. And so uh, like him, if that's you, could I encourage you uh, to consider what that might mean for you in taking that step of faith. Well, hey, if you're joining us online, you're brand new here. You're here just for your third week. Like I just met a few couples in the, in the balcony that are here. Or you've been here for a very long time. We are jumping back into our series called The Jesus Way. And I really believe it, it, it's a super important series. That's why we're doing it all the way to Easter. One for church, but, but more so one for you and for me. Because we, we don't want to get locked into our box of belief, do we? We don't want to get so locked into our experience with God that whatever has happened up in this moment is all there's going to be. No, we, we want our faith, our, our, our life with Jesus to move, right? To, to grow, to expand, to transform, because it's not only about who you are, it's also about who you're becoming. That's what it means to follow Jesus. That's what it means that when you have a life and experience like Donnie did and, and it shattered and it didn't go so away that he didn't just have that box and stay there. He said, okay, I got to step out of the box. I got to discover the Jesus way. And in doing so, Jesus captured his heart again and transformed his mind. And you know what the beautiful thing is? No matter of your spiritual journey or your age or your demographic or how many kids you have or what your bank account looks like, Jesus invites every single one of us to follow him. Like you qualify. Every one of us qualifies. You qualify because you're a sinner and you qualify because you have doubts. Why? Because we're all sinners and we all have doubts. That's why, which means... You and I are invited to have a relationship with Jesus no matter how or why you ended up here this morning. You're invited. 
I loved how Josh captured it last week in his message about the lost ones. And it was so beautifully, it, 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 it kind of resonated deeply with me when he said, as, as that father was looking and our father looks for us, he says, all it required is your willingness to be found. Sometimes it's so much easier to be in the shadows, isn't it? To, to just not be found because then I, then I don't have to face that thing or, or kind of look at God in that way that I've been so scared to look at. Yet it is true that being found at times can be inconvenient, costly, and even embarrassing. It can cause us to, to lose our business or stand out in the crowd when we'd much, much rather just fit in. Our story today is all about that journey. You can find it if you want to join me in Mark chapter 5. If you've got your Bible, or your app, or you want to pull up a web page, whatever it is, uh, please do that. Mark chapter 5, Matthew, Mark, and the New Testament. It's, Mark is one of the, the gospel writers who tells the story of this Jesus way, and I encourage you to follow along. But it's so important when we step in and, and go into Scripture that we get the context and understand what's going on. So here in Mark chapter 5, it's been over the course of a number of days. And the disciples, disciples have been journeying with Jesus, watching him, experiencing how he engaged with people, how he interacted with their stories, how, how Jesus defined their problems, how he healed their wounds. And the disciples have been traveling back and forth across what the Bible calls the lake. We know it as the Sea of Galilee. And on one of those crossings, there was, there was this dumbfounded moment for the disciples where Jesus seemed to, to, to be so calm in the middle of a terrifying storm and how, how he woke up and calmed the storm. And then, and then Jesus, how back and forth across the lake, he just told these, these cryptic stories called parables and astonished, as Mark tells us, how he restored a man who was so overwhelmed by demons, his strength was uncontainable. Literally, this man could shatter any chain that was put onto him. And so the disciples are walking with Jesus now and we parachute into the story starting in Mark chapter five, verse 21. It says this, when Jesus had crossed, uh, had again crossed by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He said, pleading earnestly with Jesus, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and leave, live. And so Jesus went with him. Now, as soon as we read those words, synagogue leader, you know something very well. You know, Jairus was influential. He was rich and he was important. The Hebrew translation of his name has had a meaning that says, whom God has enlightened. Everyone knew, and the Jewish people were convinced that he had a direct connection to God. And here he is, falling at the feet of this rabbi from Galilee. He's the guy you go to for help, not the guy needing help. And if you read a little earlier in Mark, you know that it was only a few days before that in the synagogue where this leader, Jairus and all the other leaders, had listened to the story of Jesus breaking the law by healing a man's hand on the Sabbath. And Jairus, who knew because of this, that his fellow religious leaders were planning a way to kill Jesus. The ramifications of asking that guy for help, the, the impact on Jairus's life because he decided to go talk to that man in public, life-altering, literally, could destroy his friendships, his career, his reputation, his bank account, everything. You can feel the desperation in the air. Jesus, my daughter is dying. Can you please help? Earnestly, resolutely, intently, Jairus pleads with Jesus to heal his daughter. He's not looking at the crowd, who's watching or who's pointing their fingers or who's gasping at what he's doing. In this moment, he does not care what other people think. Jesus, Jairus, Jairus has abandoned his fear, his reputation, his social class. Nothing is going to get in the way of him and the only answer to his problem. Desperately shoving his way to Jesus, literally throwing himself at Jesus' feet. My daughter is dying. I need your help now. Desperation is a good place to be, but it's a hard place to get, isn't it? 
Jairus doesn't care anymore. It's what you do when your daughter's dying, right? <laughs> the text tells us they were walking, and verse 25 says, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. The aching reality of this woman's life was actually no life at all. <laughs> Hemorrhaging day after day for 12 years straight. No relief. As, as I was looking at this passage, I'm like, I can't imagine what dealing with that type of pain and agony for 12 years would be like. Like, I, I wanted to know how long 12 years was. So what I did is I went back and said, okay, what was 12 years ago in our lifetime in 2011? Do you want to know what happened in 2011? On April 29th at Westminster Abbey, Prince William and Catherine Middleton got married in a lavish royal wedding. That was 2011. A magnitude 9.0 earthquake struck Japan, resulting in a devastating tsunami and almost creating a nuclear plant meltdown in Fukushima. You remember that? In 2011, U.S. forces killed the Al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden. Game of Thrones premiered in 2011. <laughs> Apple founder Steve Jobs passed away at age 56 in 2011, 12 years ago. And perhaps the most painful experience in 2011 is the Eastern Conference champion Boston Bruins defeated the Western Conference champion Vancouver Canucks four games to three. The Bruins ended a 39-year Stanley Cup drought and the Canucks still don't have one. I know that's a little PTSD for you Canucks fans, especially this season. That is really depressing. Oh my goodness. Maybe I should never have brought that up. But you know, that was just one year in our world, 2011. It's been 12 years since. Like, what about your world? What's the last 12 years been like for you? Like, what stories, memories, changes have happened? I'm sure as they're rattling around your brain, as they're doing in mine, uh, there are tears and smiles, gains and losses, mountaintops and valleys. For this woman, the last 12 years have been misery every single day. By law, she was ceremonially unclean, as they all said. Matter of fact, Jairus, Jairus would have said that. Leviticus 15 tells us that because of her bleeding, by law, she couldn't marry, she couldn't go to the temple or church, she couldn't be part of the community, like no mom's group, no recovery meeting to help her out, no girls' night out. She couldn't touch anyone, nor could anyone touch her or her clothes. So not only was she experiencing physical misery, she was experiencing religious misery and social misery. You think not going to church for two years in person during COVID was bad? Try 12 years. On top of that, Mark tells us she had nothing. She was destitute. Look at verse 26. She'd suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet, instead of getting better, she grew worse. Medical treatments were intense in her lifetime. As you can only imagine, they're nothing like we have today. They were more superstitious than anything. The Talmud, the Jewish law, records what, what was required of her to do to cure a hemorrhage. She had to carry the ashes of an ostrich egg wrapped in a linen rag around her neck. She had to carry barley corn from the dung of a female white donkey with her at all times. Humiliating. And she spent everything, sold everything, tried everything to get better. I don't care, I'll do it. And it all failed. And now she was truly at the end of that very short rope because none of it worked. And Mark tells us, it just got worse. The very fact that she was in the crown meant that they could stone her. Desperation? Doesn't sound strong enough, does it? Verse 27 tells us when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and she, she touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. When desperation creeps in, when the addiction rears its ugly head, when your marriage feels oh so broken, when, when your sin seems so strong, like I just can't overcome it, 
when you're at the point of no return, when it seems like you only have one option, when you're reminded of that chapter you want to forget in your last 12 years, I wonder, what story do you tell yourself? See, this woman put the entirety of her faith in the power of Jesus. Because when you believe, uh, what you believe has something to do with what you will receive from Jesus. You see, what you believe has something to do with what you will receive from Jesus. If, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. You can't miss this. She's speaking faith into her heart. The best translation of this verse is that she kept telling herself over and over again, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. If I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Every step, if I just touch his clothes, if I will be healed. As she's going through the crowd, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. She was speaking faith into her heart. But it's so hard, isn't it? It's so hard. I'll never forget when we were expecting our second child, Megan. And we were going through the pregnancy and we were living in Calgary at the time. And, and I was going off to work one morning and, and Carla wasn't feeling so good before I left. But, but uh, she called me later on the day and she said, honey, you need to come home. And we had a little toddler at the time, Brady. And, and she said, I just need your help because I'm just not doing so hot. And it was about 32 weeks into her pregnancy, about eight weeks early. And so we went, I went to the house and I got home and she was lying down. And I remember seeing her on the bed and she, she seemed really uncomfortable. I could tell something was wrong. She goes, I'm just having Braxton Hicks, which... Uh, uh, was, is pretty common during a pregnancy and she thought she was having uh, contractions and, I, and, and I'm like, oh, babe, I think we need to go to the hospital. And she, she kind of, you know, you know, as a strong woman I married, she was like, hey, I got this. And I'm like, no, I think we better go get this somewhere else. And so uh, we went to the uh, hospital and uh, uh, I remember going to the hospital and Foothills Hospital and I went into ER and, and uh, they, they admitted her right away and they said, sir, you need to check her in and register. So I'm, I'm going in registering her and I finally finished that process as you know, it takes a little while and I and I kind of find my way upstairs to the maternity hall uh, ward and uh, and uh, the, all of a sudden I hear Mr. Lanigan where were you and I'm like I was just registering we've been paging you and paging and I'm like what's up we've got to rush her out now and I see my wife on a gurney as she leaves and waves at me and I've got her clothes in my arms and I'm like what is happening and the nurse says she's almost going to have this baby early we need to get her to critical care now and so Carla leaves and I'm standing there and I'm like what is happening God so I remember calling my sister-in-law to come get my little buddy Brady and she came and picked him up and I blitzed over to the hospital. I get to the hospital and there's physicians and specialists and doctors all there and they're like, well, one thing's gonna happen. If she has this baby today, that's gonna be very bad. We want her to wait as long as possible. Two, week, two months early is a long time and she's gonna be little and so we need to inject steroids for her lungs and all these things are happening and it's so confusing and so overwhelming and the whole time you're just kind of praying and going, what's going on, God? And I'm so out of control, you know what I mean? And we got in the hospital and finally she, everything was kind of calmed down a little bit. And the nurse said, hey, you know, there's not much you can do now. All we can do is wait. And let's just hope we're waiting a long time. So I remember going home that night and everything was just kind of up in arms. You know what I mean? And everything's just kind of fuzzy. And I remember lying down in my bed by myself, right? And I'm like, oh, what is happening here? And trying to fall asleep and just praying, God, I don't know what to do because I can't do anything. I can't even feel her pain for her or nothing. I remember I got a call at 6.30 in the morning. They said, you better get down here now. She's going to have the baby. So I uh, blitzed over the hospital and, and the room was full of 13 physicians and I didn't have a whole lot to do there. I just kind of stood in there and trying to cheerlead and the baby came out. We weren't even allowed to touch the baby, hold the baby or anything. It was just critical care. She needed oxygen right away. And the next time we saw Megan was uh, fully gowned and in gloves and in masks. And uh, I remember walking into the neonatal intensive care unit and there's my less than four pound little girl with a central line coming out of her head. And I never felt more helpless. Like, God, what is going to happen here? Is she going to survive? And they said, the first 48 hours is most critical. To say we prayed prayers, to say that we beg God, please God, please, is an understatement. A few days passed and she seemed to be doing okay. And sleep apnea is the worst type of thing to happen for littles where they just lose their air and they can't gasp. And so you have to, to constantly monitor them. And I remember we had to transfer her to a new hospital and she went to a new hospital. And it was just precarious. Every day was precarious because we're trying to feed her and do all the things you need to do. And hopefully she gained weight and she lost some weight and, and the breathing was kind of up and down. And then all of a sudden, Carla and I started noticing something. Every day we started showing up, she just started to seem to get better and... 
She started to seem to improve day after day and our, our hopes were being raised. And then one day we went for the kind of the handoff where the nurses were switching their shifts and this one nurse happened to meet us. And she said, hey, I've been um, your daughter's care nurse for the last week ever since she got here. And you just need to know that I know who you are. You're a pastor at a church. And so every night I've just been praying over her and singing songs of blessing over her. God's faithful. We didn't even know it. It seemed like our prayers weren't being answered. And here's a nurse who didn't know, we didn't know, but she knew us. And she said, I've been praying for this little one every single day. And for a baby being born two months later, get out of the hospital three weeks later, unheard of. And we were so grateful. Our church designated her mega faith. That's what she designated. <laughs> and Megan uh, is going to hate me for saying that right now. <laughs> Hudson Taylor says, it does not matter how great the pressure is. Where it really matters is where the pressure lies. Whether it comes between you and God or it presses you nearer to his heart. Some of you just need to hear the truth of who God is because it's been a long time. You need to speak faith into your heart. You need to speak truth into your heart. This isn't saying that I got this or I'm talented enough or I just need to do more. It's what Jesus can do in spite of you, who God is, his, his power in your life. And it's only by God's grace that you have a breath that Megan survived and that you're here in this moment together because you're filled with the spirit. We're not given a spirit of fear, but of power. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Your word, God, is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. Knowing all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. You need to speak the truth into your heart, you dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. And the same God who spoke the world into existence can work in you and through you. We should all know those things by now, but sometimes we forget, speak them into your heart. This isn't positive thinking. It's telling yourself the truth of what Jesus can do. That's what she did. If only I can touch his clothes, I'm going to be healed. The text tells us in verse 29, immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? I love in the original language, the word is dunamis. Dunamis means dynamite. He said, who touched me? That power, that dynamite shot out from me, exploding out from him, taking back and gasping, who touched my clothes? Verse 31, you see the people crowding around you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask who touched me? Don't you love the disciples so real? Really, Jesus? Come on now. <laughs> like, really? Matter of fact, in Luke's gospel, it says the crowd was so thick you could barely breathe. That's how thick the crowd was. And they're like, everybody's touching you, Jesus. And Jesus said, Verse 32 says, but Jesus keeps looking around to see who had done it. I love that Jesus totally ignores them. I'm sure he was thinking, bros, you don't get it. I felt dynamite explode out of me. That's what's going on here. It says, then the woman knowing what had happened to her, don't miss that. The woman knowing what had happened to her came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the truth, the whole truth. She's out of herself in public. She's touched a rabbi. She's broken the law. She has nothing to author, offer, but she knows that touch has radically changed her life forever. So she tells the whole truth, everything. 12 years of pain, 12 years of suffering, all that has happened. And doesn't it feel good sometimes just to put it all out there? You know what I'm saying? And Jesus said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Isn't it compelling that Jesus stops for people who have nothing to give? You know, she had nothing. She wasn't a religious leader. She didn't have money. She wasn't, she wasn't anything special. A matter of fact, she was an outcast. And yet Jesus stops for the unnoticed, doesn't he? 
Like if you feel unnoticed today, Jesus goes, I'll stop for you. I know you. If you want to be found, I'll find you. It's not based on what you've done or given or served. It's not how it works in God's kingdom. You see, in God's kingdom, there's no prerequisite for a perfect faith or a grocery list of how to make God happy with you. You see, the woman never even proclaimed a belief about Jesus. Just inside her heart, she believed in the healing power of him. See, faith is not about beliefs, ideas, or how good you understand the Bible. It wasn't the touch or the power of positive thinking because the object of faith is more important than the quality of faith. Don't miss that. The object of faith, who you believe in, is more important than the quality of what you bring. And just because the doctors can't do it, just because you can't fix it, doesn't mean Jesus can't. You know what I'm saying? Like if you can't have a child, you can't fix a marriage, and you can't overcome this thing, Jesus can. Like what story are you telling yourself about God's faithfulness or lack thereof in your life? Your issue does not define you. Your identity is in Christ. And every time you trust Jesus for your situation, he fundamentally changes the story. Fundamentally. Why? Because faith activates God's power. We saw it there. Faith activates God's power. He didn't do it first to the woman. It was her touch. It was her reaching out. And Jesus said, some power came out of me. Your faith activates God's power. And Jesus told her it was not because of some special piece of clothing. He looked her in the eye. And when was the last time someone looked her in the eye? And he says, daughter, your faith has activated my power. Go in peace. You're healed. And Jairus is still standing there. The minutes must have seemed like hours. I've just asked Jesus to help me, and this unthing, unclean thing barges in. Jesus, I was first. Don't you think death is more critical than bleeding? Jesus, I asked you first. Jesus, I walked up, I work in the temple. I do all these things and she barges in and she comes in and you heal her first. My daughter's going to die. And worse than that, the text tells us while Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Why even bother the teacher anymore? They're yelling, what's the point? Why even try? You'll just be disappointed, Jairus. It hasn't worked before with this guy, and it's not going to work now. See, Jesus, now look, I'm sure Jairus thought, I put my entire life and career on the line for my daughter in front of all these people, not even for myself, and you chose the woman over me. Of course you did. Overhearing what they said, Jesus told them, hey, Jairus, don't be afraid. Just believe. Jairus, don't be alarmed. Just believe. Have the conviction that you can trust me to rescue Jairus. Continue to believe. Every step, believe. I wonder if in that moment, Jairus remembered his Jewish history. After all, he was a synagogue reader, ruler. I wonder if you remembered Abraham and Abraham's story. Romans tells us, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations just as it had been said to him by God, so shall your offspring be. And without weakening in his faith, he, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and his, his wife Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet, Abraham did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded, being fully persuaded, if I just touch his clothes, I can be healed. Hey, Jairus, don't be afraid. Just believe that God had the power to do what he had promised. See, Jesus, Jairus came in desperation to Jesus, thinking that Jesus had to come and lay his hands on his daughter in order for her to be healed. Hey, hey, Jesus, you need to do it my way. 
I need you to do it before she died, not after. And yet Jesus had a bigger plan. My thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways, Jesus said. And Jesus did not ask him to have the same faith as the woman. Jesus worked with the amount of faith that Jairus had. We can't miss this. Jesus does not demand for an ex- exceptional, perfect faith. He asks, asks for a faith that you have right now, in this moment, as much as you can muster today. And he looks at me, and he looks at you, and he says, Don't be afraid. Just believe. Just believe. The text tells us as they approached the home, the the hired wailers were already mourning the girl's death. And Jesus emptied the house except for a few disciples, Jairus and his wife. And he walked into the girl's room and says he took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which in our day and age would translate, hey honey, it's time to get up. Immediately the girl stood and walked around. She was 12 years old. And at this They were completely astonished. Honey, it's time to get up. So I wonder, like today, where does Jesus want you to trust his power in your life? Every single one of us. Where does Jesus want you to trust his power in your life? You know, in a few moments, I'm going to invite you to consider going to a prayer station and meeting with some of our prayer team there and having the courage to kind of step out and and just respond to what God might be saying to you today. I did a few weeks ago. I went to a prayer team and had a powerful prayer over me, a prayer of blessing for Carla and I during our relationship series. But there's some people who will go and they'll they'll put just a prayer or a confession on the cross. And it's often people in desperate situations. I took three of them and I've been praying for them. And it's people who said, I, I'm afraid, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to believe God. This one is, Lord, thank you for your love and your mercy for me. Help me, Lord, to get a job that pays me enough to provide for my family. God, I don't know how, but I'm trusting you. God, I, I hurt I'm tired of feeling afraid. I'm tired of failing. Help. Why? I believe. Heal me. Because I want to praise you. Dear Jesus, it's you that will help us get through this separation and land in your love. Help, help me to forgive myself and then extend grace and forgive my husband. I know that you will help us to stay married. Amen. Don't be afraid. Just believe, Jesus says. I want to show up. I want to help you. What I know right now is some of you are fighting it, right? I know some of you have have felt the strong call from God to follow him in recent weeks and months, to acknowledge and, and ask forgiveness for your sins. But it's really hard to humble yourself. Perhaps you you can't shake the thought of the crowd or what people in your life will think, or maybe it's your coworkers, or maybe you're just worried your family's going to mock you if you become one of those Jesus people. For others, you need to step into community. You know you've been needing to step into community, grow deeper and to connect with people in this faith community, but every week just afterwards you walk out and it's just safer. And you sense God leading you in that direction, but you've always made fun of people like that. And he kind of made it was like lame. lame. And, and now it just feels awkward that you have to do that. And, and you're just fighting it. Or maybe it's, it's just that you've been at church for a long time and you know it's time to get baptized. And you feel like it's been so long now and everybody thinks you've been baptized already, but you haven't done it. And, and it's just hard. It's just hard. Or maybe you've had a strong opinion about something in this church over the last couple of years. And you've talked to others about it. And now it's just hard to own the fact that your opinion should be let go and it should die. But it's it's a fight, it's a battle. 
Or maybe it's an addiction or some accountability. Or maybe you're in that relationship series and everything is awesome and, and, it, and it really isn't. And people ask you and say, hey, it's great. I'm doing great. Everybody's great. Kids are great. I'm great. And it just isn't great. It's easier to be a face in the crowd following along than admitting you need help. It's humbling to say, I need some prayer. So I don't know, perhaps the question should be, maybe it's time for your pride to take a back seat to God's power. I've had to do that. I've had to say, God, I want it this way. And he said, hey, my ways are not your ways. And my thoughts aren't your thoughts. Just don't fear, just believe. See, following Jesus results always in overwhelming faith because God knows you and he cares for you and you can face all kinds of trouble fearlessly. And when we rest in that trust, we can overcome circumstances without giving in to any fear. We sang about that today. We raise a hallelujah. There's a firm foundation that I stand on. And more often than not, when we step into that situation, it's a spiritual healing we encounter that leads us to transformation. It's our hearts that get renewed. So I want to encourage you as the band sings and there's a few verses that are going to come up on the screen. Maybe you want to respond. Respond with somebody you came with and just pray right there with them. Maybe take some time with God just to ask him for the courage to step out into that situation. Maybe you want to go to one of our prayer stations. We're on the stage and up top in the back corner. There's no judgment. There's joy and grace. You don't even need to say any words. Those people will pray for you and just believe for you of what God might want to do in your heart and life. Maybe you want to come to talk to somebody about Jesus. Whatever that is, I encourage you to respond to what God might be saying to you right in this moment. you can do, O oh God of wonders, your power has no end. The things you've done before in greater measure, you will do again. Because there's no prison wall you can break through. No broken body you can raise, no soul that you can't save. All things are possible. The darkest night, you can light it up. You can light it up. Oh God of revival, let hope arise. Death is over. And you've already won Oh God of revival You rose in victory And now you're seated Forever on the throne Come on church, we declare this 
arise in each one of us? Would we carry the name of Jesus well into our families, into our homes, into our workplaces, into this city?
And God, would we see lives come alive? Would we see revival in this place, in this day? Would we see your goodness in the land of the living? God, thank you for these moments. And what you've begun here, it doesn't end here. Continue to do your work, your good, powerful, life-changing work in every single one of us. In Jesus' name. Yeah, we don't want to rush through this. If there's more work that needs to be done, that's, uh, I'd say that's pretty important. So these stations, they're going to remain open. Uh, or maybe there's a friend around you or just someone you just want to say, hey, can we just chat or pray for a few more minutes? Uh, take this space. Don't rush away from this. Thanks so much for being here together, family. This is, uh, this is a beautiful thing when we get to encounter and pursue the name of Jesus together. Yeah. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. joined us today and I mean that because we've been praying for you. We've been praying that God would meet you whether it's through a song or through a prayer or through maybe what was spoken on the story of Jairus and the hemorrhaging woman. Whatever it is, our hope and belief is the same thing. Don't be scared, just believe. And maybe you want to come join us in person or let us know what God's been doing in your life. Send us a prayer request. Go to our website trinitychurchcolona.ca. There you can get connected into one of our digital groups or get connected to one of our groups here at Trinity. Uh, know this, that we're praying for you this week and we're so excited when you invite a friend and when you come back. So thanks for being here today. We can't wait to see you next week. Have a great day.